allegation we've got to put to you is apparently you're an obsessive Britney Spears fan. <laughs> The important stuff first. <laughs> that is true. I do like a bit of Taylor Swift as well, to be really? honest. Really? <laughs> really? What's your favourite Taylor Swift song? Well, I, I was tempted to say we are never, ever getting back together, but I think the Labour Party needs to leave all of that behind us Well, now. that's a very <laughs> good point. And move forward. Because Jess Phillips stood down yesterday saying she couldn't get the Labour Party back together. She wasn't the person to unite all the different parts of the party. <laughs> what makes you think you could do that? I very much admire the very smooth segue from Taylor Swift to Jess Phillips. I think she'll be pleased with that. And I suppose <laughs> the reason that I'm in this contest is because I do genuinely think that the Labour Party wants to pull together and move forwards. And I'm someone who is genuinely non-factional. I might come from the left of the party, but I don't feel in any sense that people in other parts of the movement don't have something to offer. In fact, the challenge that we offer to one another is what enables us to raise our game You're, and um, to have reach out into very different parts okay. of this country. Your uh, rival, Rebecca Long-Bailey, was asked what, how she would rate Jeremy Corbyn, who, in some people's minds, <laughs> lost you the election. And she said she would give him 10 out of 10. Uh, what would you give Jeremy Corbyn? I, if you don't mind me saying, it's just the daftest question that I've ever heard. I mean, people are human beings. They're complex. It's perfectly possible to believe that Jeremy Corbyn did a lot for the Labour Party in moving us away from an era where we Sorry, were... is it the question? Uh, are you saying that the question... Mugs, what, how and you would feel rate, that we should have won an election and we needed to do better. The leader of the Labour Party is a daft question, or are you saying that giving, them, yes. giving him 10 out of 10 is a daft answer? I mean, do you think that was a good answer? No, I just I don't think that it, for a minute that we should be rating people out of 10. Leaders are complex. Okay. They have achievements and successes, and they also do things that many of us don't agree with. Jeremy Corbyn is no exception to that. OK, but so the, you wouldn't rate is, him 10 out is, of though, 10. The truth is, but though... But how would you describe most him, Most people... Then? The electorate gave him about half out of 10. Right, He got one of the biggest drubbings in the history of elections. There's no getting away from that. The, the Labour Party was... You know, yeah. absolutely annihilated. Voting for and people the challenge... and rating them is and... part of the electoral process. Well, yeah, process. but the challenge now for the Labour Party is who's going to be electable? Because you can all talk as much as you like about what you would do, but without power, it is meaningless. Sure. How are you going to be, if you win this race, how are you going to get elected? How are you going to persuade the electorate you're not full of hot air like they assumed Corbyn to be, you're actually full of meaningful substance that's going to improve their lives enough to make them vote for you? Well, I think, first of all, you have to show a level of humility about what's just happened. In parts of the world like mine, a former coalfield community, we've just seen the entire Labour base collapse. So there's no question that we've got this wrong. And we have to accept that for a lot of people, they feel that Labour has been moving away from them from a for a very long time. But we also have to go out and talk about the world, not as it once was or we would like it to be, but we have to go out not there, not just with dreams about the future, but with a plan for what we're going to do to get investment back into many of those communities that turned Tory for the first time. That's what I've been thinking about, talking about for the last five years. We set up a think tank called Centre for Towns and we've been pumping out ideas about okay, how you get investment just, into infrastructure, right. skills and young people in those okay. areas. Just and Philip, that, that's just what Philip's. I want Labour to do. I want us to start talking about the future, okay. not just obsessing about our past. Very good idea. Jess Phillips uh, said, just before she left the race, that the mic should be passed to a woman. Uh, and then, with great irony, uh, she then, as one of the women candidates, dropped so out. She couldn't do the job. So she couldn't receive the mic, even if it got passed to her. Was she right in saying that because the Labour Party's never had a female leader, and there are now so many female candidates in this race and only one man, was she right to say that the right thing for the party is to have a woman leader next? Well, I'd dearly like to see us have a woman leader, not just because we never have and it matters on a personal level, but also because for the country, I think this is a bit existential for the Labour Party. If we talk about equality, the fact that we're the only political party, I think, who hasn't had a woman lead the party on a permanent basis is a real problem for us. But this contest really has got to be about raising our game, uh, upping our ideas, talking about the country we want us to be. And all of the candidates have something to offer in that. I mean, in the last few years, if we're honest, I think we have to acknowledge that the Tories are the ones who sounded ambitious and optimistic about the future of Britain. 
even at a time when they've managed to reduce this country to its knees through their internal obsessions about Brexit. And Labour has to go out and show that we're ambitious for the future of this country. And that means that Keir, Emily, Becky and I have got to make sure that we're in this okay. contest, that we're raising well, the your bar. Father, your father. And that whoever comes out as leader at the end of this okay. process has, is strengthened by the process right, and has uh, something to say about the future. Your father, Dipak, as an Indian Marxist who apparently views you as far too right-wing for his liking. Is that true? <laughs> well, he's very proud of me, um, <laughs> as I am of him. Um, he's, a, he's a Marxist academic. He came to Britain in the 60s and, he, you know, he's been very influential in my thinking because my family stretches a wide range of political thought, from Marxism to liberalism and everything in between. And it's one of the reasons why I listen to what people have to say and when I take on my opponent's arguments, I do so at the core and not just around okay. the fringes. Do you, do you think because, really because of your background, Labour. Lisa? We've been talking about the NHS for a long time and people accept that we want, we care about the NHS, but we've got to start thinking okay. about taking on the but arguments the where it's hard for us, not just easy. As the only candidate with any diversity in your upbringing, uh, do you think this whole debate around the Meghan Markle, uh, that uh, was the media coverage racist, did it drive her out and so on, what's your take on that? I mean, do you think Britain... Is, remains inherently a, a racist country, as many saw it many decades ago? I, I think Britain is a much more decent country than some sections of the media would have us believe. I represent a town in the north of England where working-class people have c come out consistently over decades and driven out the far right. We saw off Tommy Robinson last year. I think this country is far more decent than we're portrayed by some sections of the media. And the way that Meghan Markle was treated, I didn't like it at all. My colleague Holly Lynch got together a group of women MPs and we signed a letter to ask for better coverage of Meghan. I think this is not shown the British media in its best light. And See, that's I would take issue with that. I would take issue with that. British media, including thought, local papers, I thought that, that, are, letter, that are really I, decent. I thought, well, I, know letter, you will, I thought that letter was ridiculous. <laughs> I thought it didn't bear any relation to the reality, which is Meghan Markle's had exactly the same level of treatment as someone like Kate Middleton, for example, good and bad in equal measures. If you're a member of the royal family, you get acres of press coverage. I would say... 70% of the Meghan coverage has been positive, 30% has been negative, and she just doesn't like the negative stuff. It's got nothing to do with her skin colour, nothing to do with her gender. It's just they've done stuff that the British public and the media reflect British public opinion most of the time just thought was wrong. Well, if you don't mind me saying, how on earth would you know, as somebody who's never had to deal with ingrained prejudice, you're not in a position to understand people who have? I'll tell, tell you how I know. I'll tell you how I know, because, the, because the media... I'll tell you how I know, Lisa, because the media, right up to that wedding, were universal in their uh, outpouring of praise and support for what a wonderful thing it was that we were having a biracial woman entering the white monarchy. Finally, we were dragging the monarchy, kicking and screaming, into a multiracial world which reflected the, the actual nature of this country now. So this idea that somehow we're all a bunch of racists, well, the coverage right to the point of that wedding actually was completely the opposite. It embraced everything about what Meghan Markle could bring to the monarchy. So I just don't accept this narrative, that just because she then got criticised for, in my view, a series of missteps, that becomes automatically racist. Could I say something? Yes. yes. OK, um, so I don't, know where, I don't know who you're pushing back against in this sort of interview, because... I said exactly the opposite. I said it was a real shame that some sections of the media had treated this as uh, in the way that they did because most of the media, including many local papers, are allies in the fight against racism and discrimination in Britain. And it's, I would much rather that their voices were heard. Did, so I mis did I misinterpret you there? You were, saying, you were actually saying you don't think the media's been racist to Meghan Markle? I don't think the media is one entity. I think there are different parts of the media who do different things. And I think, on the whole, the media does a good job of reflecting this country, particularly at, at local and regional level, where you often get a much more um, tangible discussion about things that really affect people's lives and the issues that matter to people forced onto the political agenda. But um, the way that Meghan Markle was treated by some sections of the media, I didn't like it. And I think that Britain can do better than that. I think we're a very, very decent country and I think people deserve better.